welcome everybody to Clearwater Jazz Holidays, Young Lions Jazz Master Sessions. Today's guest educator and musician is Brandon Robertson, back with us again on his topic, Thinking Like a Horn Player. From a bass perspective, we're recording these sessions for the purposes of Clearwater Jazz Holidays Education and Outreach. Participants are muted for the courtesy of this session, but if you have questions, we will get those questions to Brandon. Please visit clearwaterjazz.com forward slash education. That's the education and outreach section of our website to see all these upcoming free virtual sessions. And you can visit us at a new resource called the studio. So from the education and outreach page, you can link to the studio where you can watch for free all of the full archive recorded sessions, and in many instances, take advantage of other session materials and links to Spotify curated playlists that complement the sessions. We also have a new podcast available on multiple platforms brought to you by our wonderful partner, Marine Max Clearwater. And these are the audio portion of these sessions. So if you'd like to go for a walk or lay in bed, and listen to these sessions, you can do so for free, available wherever you stream your podcasts. We're very excited about that. So we have Brandon back with us today. Brandon is an Emmy-nominated music director, professional upright electric bassist, composer, and music educator, originally from Tampa, Florida. He completed his Bachelor of Arts in Music from Florida State University in 2009 and a Master of Music in Jazz Studies in the spring of 2016. Currently, Brandon is the Director of Jazz Studies at the Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers. He, he was nominated for an Emmy Award for Best Documentary for Educational Collegiate Programs featuring the Florida Gulf Coast University Jazz Ensemble. As a prominent band leader, Brandon has taken his band on multiple national tours, headlining at some of the top jazz venues in the country. To add to this impressive resume, Brandon has performed with notable acts, such as the world famous Count Basie Orchestra led by director Scotty Barnhart, vocalist Carmen Bradford, Jason Marsalis, Marcus Roberts, Marty Morell, and many, many others. He's also been featured as a performer and band leader at many national jazz festivals. And just this past fall, he released his first debut album entitled Based on a True Story, which reached all the way to number 16 on the iTunes Top 200 release, which is fantastic. So Brandon, we, uh, as always, uh, really appreciate you being with us in these sessions. I'm going to turn it over to you. The stage is all yours. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation for having me back on board again. I've been enjoying doing these sessions. So um, it's been a pleasure. And I hope that the future audience who views this will appreciate um, the abundant amount of resources that this organization is providing. So I just wanted to say that off off the bat. Thank you guys very much. Uh, so for today, today's topic is probably one topic that most bass players would shy away from if you were to ask them about improvisation. Um, when I was an undergrad, when I was a freshman at Florida State, my very first, uh, my very first lesson I had my first semester, my bass professor, Rodney Jordan, he asked me, Brandon, how many melodies do you know on bass? And I said, well, not, not too many. He said, okay. He says, how do you feel about improvising? I said, I suck. <laughs> Just flat out. I'm terrible. He's like, okay. Now, what have you done to try to improve this? I said, well, my band teacher in high school would tell me to listen to recordings and to transcribe and to write out the solos. And he says, no, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to start all over. Who do you listen to on the recordings when you're trying to learn how to improvise? Who are you listen to? And by nature, I would say the bass player because that's my instrument. So... 
I'm listening to the bass player. But if you listen to a lot of traditional recordings, the bass player isn't soloing a lot. <laughs> so if you listen to any records from, especially, actually, I won't, I would say you don't really start hearing soloistic features until the late forties, early fifties is when you start to hear bass players start to take solos. And even then it was very seldom that they did. Um, it, I would say more so in the, in like mid fifties to, to the sixties, going into the sixties where you started to see, you started to hear a lot more recordings where there was bass players performing or soloing a lot more. So, he had me go back and research the tradition of how bass players approach solos and in, in within their within their performance. So I go back and I listen to Jimmy Blaine, you know, Jack the Bear with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. And that's kind of considered the prerequisites prerequisite of what bass players went to do preceding that Oscar Pettifer kind of took it to another level of of his solos with with precision of his eighth note runs but particularly when you're learning about jazz bass and you're learning about melodic solos you most folks start with Jimmy Blanton's solo from Jack the Bear and I use that solo because I think about the players um, that's the that's the first solo that I would think of and I think about that particular one because you guys, you had he had guys like Lester Young, Ben Webster. I mean, he was around a bunch of significant. I mean, Johnny Hodges, a a a, a, a very eclectic, significant amount of horn players who can really improvise. And even then, even when Col Coleman, even with Coleman Hawkins' uh, body and soul, they're still improvisational within the melody itself, the way he performed that melody. So my teacher had me go back and listen to these old big band recorders. Now, when you start to think, well, how can I transfer information from a horn player to the upright bass? There's a lot of, there's a lot of great transfers. My first start that my teacher had me do, he says, I want you to listen. I want you to find a solo. And then I want you to listen to that solo. And I want you to try to sing along what you're hearing. Okay. Because on bass, we're so grounded with root motion that when we start to take solos, it sounds like we're playing a triadic pattern, like a scalier pattern and not necessarily a melodic pattern. So what I did was I said, okay, let me go back and, and let me just think about some great solos, right? So the very first solo, which people thought I was crazy for doing this, but the very first solo that I that I tried to transcribe and listen for was um, Charlie Parker's blues, Cheryl. Um, Cheryl was, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a C blues, and the way he starts off that melody, or the, 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 the solo, it's so simple, but it's but he uses non intervallic notations. What I mean by that is he's using non diatonic notes within the chord to start his solo off. Which when I listened to it the first time, I thought he was playing a bunch of wrong notes. I'm like, he's not playing within the he's not playing within the chord. But then as I started to listen to what he was doing, horn players, specifically saxophone players, because they can they can play a specific phrase they can hold up to probably eight or I would say no I'll say more a little more nine to maybe 12 notes at a time if you're thinking about a phrasing so if you have four beats with four 16th notes that's a whole lot it sounds like they're playing a lot more notes than what what, it, what they're actually doing on bass that would sound like this so how do I take that information and I break that down? So that particular song, Cheryl, I learned the melody. And within the melody, there's a part of the melody, which I'm going to get up really quick, and I'm going to play that part of the melody for you. There's a part of the melody where on the traditional four chord, which in the key of C, we're talking to F7, he plays a altered scale 
over that chord, which is the melody. It's the, the actual melody, that, the notes that he's playing is an alter scale. Now, I didn't realize that's what he was doing until I actually studied it. And I thought it was really cool because on bass, it sounds, well, we like to use the jazz term, it sounds really out. It's, it's what I mean by it when, and for the younger players that are watching this, when you hear a jazz person say, man, they're playing out, that means they're playing out of the key center tonality wise. They're still playing within the frame of the, of the tune, but tonality wise, they're playing outside the, seek, the, 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 the key center, which then usually they'll find a note, which is usually a diatonic note that resolves back into the original key that they're in. That's how horn players think. And I hear that so much. And when you play behind really great horn players, that's what you tend to hear. So for example, going to put this down for a second. Okay, going to turn this here for a second. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Thumbs up. Okay, great. So this is an example of, of, of that melody that I was referring to with Charlie Parker. Now, there's a part of that melody where he plays this alter scale. And when you hear it, how he resolves it, he resolves it right on the third of the, of the one chord. So it sounds like this. Okay, so that example, right there, d d b d b d do d b d b ho b d b d, that lick right there stood out, out of the entire melody. Everything else, there's a, there's another spot where we're at the end, instead of playing a D seven, he plays an A flat seven, it's like a tritone sub. But other than that, everything sounds very cohesive to the ear. But when I heard that particular section, dee -boo -dee -boo -dee -boo -dee -boo -dee, I had to sit at the piano and figure out what it was, why is he playing that? And what he did was when I really, when I started to really understand and study Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker would introduce two type of intervals that had never been played in jazz before him and Dizzy started going off with the bebop era. Sharp five and sharp nines. Those two particular notes or those two intervals did not exist in any kind of big band charts or any kind of music before 1945, or I should say 44. And if you go back and you listen to Charlie Parker between the years of 46 to about 48, you will hear all of these altered sounds. And what I learned from doing my research is a lot of horn players who study classical music, they take these etudes, these, these etudes that have these very melodic and intervallic passages. And what the jazz cast, the real cast was doing was taking those passages and they were inverting them into what they were playing in jazz. That's kind of how bebop started getting its sound because the traditional route, you would have a one, a four, and a five. Or in this case, you'd have a one sharp four, five, and those kind of intervals, or a sharp four would be a sharp eleven. So those these these altered intervals with within the triads was creating these very dissonant sounds. So if you go back and listen to a, uh like Donna Lee, which I on um, on under my session on the Clearwater Jazz um, education page, um, there should be a link there, a YouTube link of me playing the head to Donna Lee. Um, Donna Lee is another, is another tune that Parker played that, A, it's one of the hardest tunes to play on bass. That tune is ridiculously hard to play on bass. But what's cool is the second half of that tune where he goes, he starts to again you hear this diminish 
sound and it uses that diminished sound to go right big right back into a two five one progression again these are elements that when i when i think of as a bass player when i solo i'm thinking like that like i'm thinking okay how is it that these horn players are able to navigate through these changes and think of the things that they're thinking of so all they're doing is they're altering sequences so in this case on bass it's patterns so i teach my students that if you use the same pattern and you go up a fourth like if i was playing a blues and i started on an f7 and then i would go b flat seven e flat seven a flat seven d flat seven G flat seven, B seven, E seven, tritone back to B flat. I've heard several bass players do that. And what I what I figured out was that is a Dexter Gordon lick. Dexter Gordon, if you go back and listen to um, I have it right here in front of me, so I could tell you. Um, Daddy plays horn. That record, Daddy Plays Horn. If you listen to Cheesecake, the the tune, specifically the tune Cheesecake. He plays that same alternate pattern. He does it like three times in his solo. And it took me a very long time to understand how horn players are hearing these kind of chord progressions or these, or these sequences. How are they hearing it? And so all they're doing is they're altering two or three notes at a time. It's either the fifth or the extension of that chord, which will usually be the ninth. And they're usually alternating those two, those two intervals, which subsequently would change the tonality of the chord. So on bass, there's a lot of things that I can do. For instance, so for instance, if I, if I played that same pattern I was talking about over blues, if I did an F blues, it'll sound like this. So what I did there was that's a that's a very common pattern that they would go and trade off in force moving across uh, horizontally across the base. What that does is creates a lot of tension. And so if a horn player, if I was soloing and I was and I had a piano player accompany me and they heard me do that. If the piano player is hip and is up to par with what with what you're doing then what they do is they'll play the tritone of those fourths against what you're doing. So you both will resolve on that four chord at the same time. That's something that I actually learned from listening to a lot of horn players. I also learned that a lot of horn players will recycle the exact same lick over and over and over. And at first I used to think, well, man, y'all have nothing else to say. Stop playing. <laughs> like, you have nothing else to repeat. But then I learned from Marcus Roberts that re repetition is what captures the audience because, like, when you learn, when you sing, a, when you learn a really good melody, like when you learn a song, for instance, there's something in that song that re that's that's repetitive that makes you want to keep singing it or you keep saying the same thing over and over so with horn players when they go do ba doo ba dee boo dee that's the famous jazz lick right so we've all heard that lick and there's a youtube video there's a youtube video of it's like 70 years of the jazz of the lick and then they show like a a 50, 60 year decade period of every jazz musician playing that same lick. However, what happens is, is it's not that you're repeating the same thing over and over. You are reciting the language. And so I had to understand that what the repetition I was hearing was they're just reciting and they're speaking a language that if you play this music and you study it you'll recognize it so as a bass player i try my best to not necessarily mimic 
what Charlie Parker would do or verbatimly play what Charlie Parker plays. But I would take certain licks or certain um, intervallic motion that they're doing, and I would just replicate that on bass and just transfer it and either play it rhythmically differently or use the same harmonic palette, but just use it in a different place of the tune. So one, uh, a couple of great solos for bass players uh, that, that they can learn. One of the very, very first solos that I actually was able to play on bass. Now I said earlier, I did learn Cheryl, but I could not play that Charlie Parker solo. He, blah, 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 he's all over the place. But the first one that I learned was off of, um, uh, what's that? What's the tune? I just played, I played it last week. Oh, so what? Miles Davis. Now most, I think if not every single jazz student in high school if you if you're studying jazz and your teacher tells you to go check out kind of blue they tell you learn miles davis's solo on so what now with miles here's the cool thing about miles the the cast that i was speaking about earlier plays saxophone but trumpet when you listen to a trumpet player play a solo it's a lot more brash and, and i'm not saying it in a bad way but just the, it's, the, the, the articulation is a lot more defining than when you hear a, a saxophone solo because there's a lot of air pushing through the horn, whereas the release of the air out of the trumpet is so quick and it's very precise that if a trumpet player were to play a very aggressive solo, their sound will be humongous because it'll just be right in your face because of the nature of the bell of their instrument, right? So when you listen to Miles, Miles's Miles's solos were not only simple, but it was so deeply, deeply rooted in the pocket of the song. So if you listen to that solo, uh, do do, boop it, doop it, do do. That's when I first heard that, I said, That's it? Why is everybody wowing over this? That's that's this there's, there's nothing special about that. But there is because the simplicity of it, the audience can get it. Like if you're and that's what my teacher was trying to tell me. He said, if you listen to great horn players, you're able to sing along with their with their solos because their solos are so simple and and melodic that your ear has a chance and has time to regurgitate everything that you're absorbing so i i had i learned that solo and i also learned miles's solo off of autumn leaves and that's probably one of the second most popular uh uh solos that you can learn one of the one of the things that i like about that solo is miles never he, he, I think he used, I think he hits the root maybe three times in that entire solo. He always resolved his ending of his phrases, his phrases on an upper extension of the chord. So, like the very first, the very first note he plays is a D natural in that, in that solo. That's the nine of that C minor seven chord. So, he's starting off with an upper extension. And then when he goes to the next note, he's now on the fifth. He comes back down to the nine, and now he's on the third. So he's using, he's finding ways to go around the circle of intervals. And I really, I really learned a lot studying Miles' solos as t in terms of the melodic placements because the way he would play, the way, the way he would place a note on the beat, it'd be like, what? Why did he choose? That's that's strange. But then you think about it. I'm like, okay, rhythmically, he landed on a strong beat. So whatever note he wanted to choose fit to land on that on that beat, he wanted to make a statement. So on bass, a lot of great bass players like Christian McBride, they'll play these licks that are very simple, but they're on really strong beats. So they make a statement right off the bat. OK, and that's that is something that is very um, useful. Another tune that I wanted to uh, I wanted to exa uh, give example of is Dexter Gordon's 
version of Charlie Parker's confirmation. And I believe that's off of the same record. Uh, Daddy plays horn. Yeah, it is. And um, I learned, I actually learned his solo for a jury I had to do in college. And the one thing I like about Dexter Gordon is Dexter Gordon plays a lot of blues in his solos. I mean, you can hear blues from the beginning all the way to the very end of his solos, even on ballads. It's crazy how infused he is with, with the blues. And one of the common licks that uh, he liked to use, he plays that lick. I learned that lick. I know that lick by heart because I've heard it on so many records that he's played. And that's another good thing that bass players, I would tell you to do is – once you once you find a record that you like, don't listen to the bass player. Don't the bass player should be the very last person that you listen to. Now, I've had other theorists and educators who would say, ah, I don't agree with that. That's fine. We're we're allowed to agree to, to, to we're allowed to agree to disagree. However, what my philosophy on that is if I want to learn a tune first. I'm going to learn the melody. So I'm going to listen to the person who's playing the melody. I'm not going to listen to the bass. I'm going to listen to whoever's playing the melody. If it's the bass player, then that's cool. But if not, I'm going to listen to the horn player, right? Or the guitarist or the pianist, whoever's playing the melody. Then secondly, if I want to really learn how to solo over this, over this tune, I'm going to listen to whoever I feel at the moment has the most vital information that they're playing. Like whoever is soloing that has enough information that I can extract that is easy for me to pull from. Not, and I'm not talking about who has the best solo on the record. I'm talking about who has the most, who has the most clearest ideas within their solo that'll be easy for me to understand and comprehend in that moment. And that's what I teach a lot of my younger uh, bass students. I tell them, if you're going to listen to a horn player, listen to the horn player who is providing the most information in their solo. Because you have a lot of horn players, like I use John Coltrane, for instance. I love his solo on Bessie's Blues. I love that solo. If you ask me if I love Giant Step's solo, I don't. Because it's so, he's, he's playing so much information the 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 time I would have to sit there and spend to extract that and break it down and then try to apply it on bass, that would take me eons, right? From Bessie Smith, he's playing just so much bluesy stuff and he's using a lot of space. It's easy for me to comprehend it. So, so my advice is to make sure that you are able to find solos that you can comprehend and that you're able to sing along with. That's why I mentioned about the two mile solos because there's, they're simple, but you can actually sing along with it. And once you get that under your, under, under in your membrane and you get that under your belt, you're solid. Okay. Um, there's another, there's two more horn players that I want to talk about briefly uh, before we wrap up. Um, Sonny Rollins, and Clifford Brown. Clifford Brown was one of those greats that we lost very early. I think he passed away at 25. And he was he was a powerhouse that was going to literally change the entire scene of jazz had he not passed away. Um, cats like Freddie Hubbard, Lee Morgan, Booker Little, you know, these guys, Blue Mitchell, they're, they all pull from a lot of what Clifford Brown provided. Um, the particular record that I put on my Spotify list was Studying Brown. Um, that was probably one of my – I wore that entire record out the entire time I was in college because of just the sheer amount of information that Clifford Brown was providing on those records, okay? Particularly, particularly uh, Daoud. That's that's one of my favorites and Sandu. Now, Sandu has like a bluesy type feel to it. And his solos are like I said before, when you have a horn player that can play very articulate, like I mean rhythmically, his articulation was just on the dots. <laughs> it was it was very hard. It was very hard for you to feel Clifford Brown not playing behind the beat which is why I think him and Max Roach were a great pair. 
And when I studied Clifford Brown, Clifford Brown actually likes to play a lot of scalier motions. So you'll hear him go, like he goes all the way up. He'll go all up the scale, past the uh, up to the extension, and come back down. But when he comes back down, a lot of his patterns he will skip over intervals. So it almost sounds like he's changing. It's like, it almost sounds like he's uh he's changing the color tones of of the of that pattern. And he and he and he uses this same sequence a lot. He does this a lot. Okay, if you listen to his solo on Joy Spring, okay, the definitive Clifford Brown off that record. If you listen to him play Joy Spring, that is probably one of the greatest examples because he uses a lot of triplets, but the triplets that he uses are passing tones. So every time he resolves, he resolves on a third, a seventh a flat seven or a nine, one of those three intervals. And it happens all throughout that entire song because that entire song is based around a two, five progression. And so on bass, playing those kind of progressions on bass are much easier because playing two fives are all sub uh, subsequently in the same shape. They're all in the same position on the upright bass. So I take someone like Clifford Brown and I take, the, the the rhythmic precision and the harmonic precision, I, I extract that information from his playing. Miles, I take the simplicity, but yet the subtleness of his solos, and then I try to mesh them together. Um, the last person that I wanted to talk about that I mentioned just now was Sonny Rollins. Now, to me, when it comes to 50s saxophonists, Sonny's my man, hands down. I, I mean, I love Hank Mobley, too. Hank Mobley is a soulful cat. Shout out to Hank Mobley, my bass players. Make sure y'all listen to Soul Station. That is one of the greatest records <laughs> that ever came out during that era. However, Sonny Rollins, when you hear him play, it's so soulful and bluesy that I felt like any time I've ever listened to Sonny Rollins, I learned his solo just off of the first time hearing it because he plays, he plays with so much space and the licks that he uses are very precise. So for example, on, uh, I think it's blues, blues by seven. Oh, blue seven. That's off of, uh, that's off of saxophone Colossus. You listen to that record. Beep, boop, beep, boop, 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 boop. A lot of tritones there in the entire melody. And then when he starts the solo, he goes, he does another tritone at the end. And so I hear those things and on bass, it sounds so hip because the bass, the frequency of the bass is so low. So when you play that lick on bass, it's like, oh, that was kind of hip, you know? And Sonny, what I actually like about Sonny is, he uses space, you know. A lot of people will argue and say, oh, John Coltrane has all these great solos and this and then the third. He does. I'm not knocking. Coltrane's the man, hands down, will always be. But if you listen to a lot of Coltrane's solo, there's seldom amount of space within his solos unless he's playing a ballad or a very medium tune. Other than that, he's, he's, he's taking up all the space. It's very hard for piano players to comp. If you listen, anybody play, any piano players play behind John Coltrane, you don't hear them comping much. If you don't believe me, go listen to Giant Steps. You don't hear Tommy Flanagan comping a lot. <laughs> he's trying, but, he, but, it's, but Coltrane is filling up everything else. But you listen to Blue 7, Sonny is leaving so much space. And I've learned from great horn players. That's why I say I'm thinking like a horn player from a bass player. Horn players are actually listening to us. So my young bass players, I'm letting you know right now, if you hear a saxophone player or a trombone player or a trumpet player drop out in the middle of their solo, it's for two reasons. Reason number one, you must be playing some real hip stuff that they're digging, so they're trying to figure out, well, how can I answer? Because whatever you're playing, <coughs> excuse me, whatever you're playing or the rhythm section is playing, if it's, a, if it's in tune to what they're doing, 
they're going to listen. They're going to pull back a little bit. Or you might be playing something that's really out and they have no clue what you're doing. So they're going to stop for a second and listen to where you are in the form. So when it comes time to solo, a lot of times what I like to do is when I play behind horn players, I listen for, I listen for repetitive licks that they might use. And usually what I'll do is I'll either play the same lick coming out of their solo or I will play a lick that responds to their to what they just said. So if they went that's that is that is an answer. That they 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 put out a response or a or a question and I answered it. So a lot of the times I've learned that from listening to records that Bass players do that. If you go back and listen to uh, Money Jungle with Duke Ellington, um, Max Roach, and, and Mingus, and if you listen to how they play Caravan, even though, even though Mingus isn't solo on it, but the way he walks, he's complimenting, he's answering directly with how, what Max is playing on the drums. It's like a direct, it's like a call, it's like a conversation that they're having amongst each other, right? Um, same thing too, if you listen to, um, I forget whose version of it, but there's a version where Oscar Pettiford is playing Caravan, and he actually quotes the horn player's solo. He quotes it, the first A section. He plays the whole thing, and I thought that was amazing because I was like, this dude has total recall. He just literally played back what he just heard. And that was probably the first time he heard it in real time because they're recording it. So one of the three key things that a bass player can do to, to really get a melodic solo like a horn player. Number one, listen to the, listen to the soloist who has the most information to provide within their solo. Number two, Listen for repetitive sequences that you hear the soloist do, uh, do in the moment. So they go, if you hear a sequence like that, that is something that you can extract. And that's very simple to do on bass because all it is is you're, you're just changing intervals, but you're keeping the same patterns. You're, you're doing the same shapes. And then lastly, lastly, you want to always uh, – find solos that have that has something to say you know there's a lot of people who just solo and they just go they just go 50 miles an hour you know but try to find a solo that you actually get when you go back and listen to it it almost sounds like they're having a conversation with you that information is so much easier to extract and you don't and i also, and I also learned this from playing with really great horn players too they always tell me we like bass players that don't play a whole lot of notes in a solo. And I say, really? Because I'm listening to Christian and all these guys is he's like, yes, but they're they're in that one percent category that can actually do it effectively. Because you got the ones that can effectively do it, and then you have the ones who try to, and it comes out a lot different. So I always try to start off my solos very simple, very spacious, and then by this time, I would have already collected my thoughts on what I want to do next, and then I start taking it up a notch. So that would actually uh, that actually concludes this uh, my portion of what I had to say. Um, I, I think I covered everything that I needed to cover, um, and, and make sure everyone that you go back and check out that Spotify uh, playlist that I put on there. There's a lot of great horn solos on there that I put, and and they're and they're very user friendly in terms of transcribing. So, uh, yeah, that's good to go. <laughs> Another awesome session. Brandon, man, thank you so much, Brandon. Such good thank stuff. You. They, so you're going to be back with us on July 20th, Raise the Bar, Preparation for Performance. So we're excited about you coming back. There's a lot of good stuff, man. If you, if you go to uh, Clearwater Jazz's education and outreach page, the upcoming sessions are list, listed there. We've got uh, right after this session today – uh, Austin Vickery is joining us with a topic called a piano lesson from a horn player. Why jazz horn players should learn piano. 
What do you think mm. about that, Brandon? Now, that that actually is a is a not only a true statement, but it's important. Um, I saw an interview Ray Brown did back in the seventies, and they asked him. They said, "You know, Mr. Brown, what is what is something that you do to really capture like your sound?" And he says, "I spend a lot of time on the piano." I really feel that if a bass player is very versatile on the piano, it'll really open up their playing. And I remember reading and seeing that interview, and I said, wow, that's, that makes a lot of sense why certain bass players sound really melodic. Like, if you listen to this, I found out recently, Scott LaFaro was, was, was classically trained on piano, had no clue. But it makes sense because when you hear him solo, he, he literally melodically can run up and down the bass. I had no clue he had a piano background, like a classical piano background. So that's true. So yeah, that, that's going to be a great topic. I really hope that people tune into that. Yeah, I mean, Austin, like you, Austin is all in with this stuff. And he, uh, he, has, he also has great session materials. So um, for sure, uh, tune into Austin. But, but uh, we've got, I mean, there's so many great players that are participating with us on this program. James Suggs is back with us. Um, coming up soon with a topic he calls different approaches to swing and we've got um, he's doing one with Dwayne White I don't know if I could even say this topic right Dwayne will Dwayne says it best but it's and they played that some of our favorite trumpet solos so <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne does that uh uh topic title justice more than I can, but that's going to be really good. Um, right. Valerie Gillespie is going to be joining us for the first time coming up uh, soon, um, which is going to be fantastic. She's doing one on communication among band members. Pete Carney mm. is back with us with his Safer at Home practice series. Um, and we've got some jazz vocalists coming on board soon. Um, it's just you know, the list goes on and on into now the mid part of August. So please check that out. Check out the studio resource where all of these sessions are archived to watch after the fact with all these other materials and this new podcast, the Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions podcast. Um, if, if listening is your thing rather than watching, what a great way to absorb all this wonderful information. So we For thank sure. the Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation for um, its support uh, and development, implementation of all these wonderful resources and our sponsors as well, um, particularly as it relates to this episode, the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association. Thank you for your great support. And Brandon, we can't wait to see you again soon. Thanks so much for participating. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, once again, thank you to the Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation to the Owl Down and Tampa Bay Jazz Association. You guys are fantastic. I love working with you all. I, I keep praising you all on such an amazing job that you all have done this summer and, you know, keeping our youth, you know, still engaged because of what's going on. So, I mean, this is a wonderful platform, so I'm happy to be a part of it. So thank you. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. We appreciate those comments very much. And for everybody uh, with us today and watching in the future, uh, stay safe, be well, and keep playing. Keep playing. That's right. <laughs> See you, Brandon. Right. See you guys.